My name is Jane Netherton, and I have chair of the Board of Governors for California State University of Long Beach, and we have sponsored this event for the 18 years that it has been presented. However, we could not have gone for 18 years without the contributions and support of our sponsors and for all of those in the room today that have been to probably uh, almost 18 of them. I see a lot of faces who have been here every year. I know a few of you that I've talked to have missed one. And unfortunately, I missed one. I was out of the country last year. But uh, this is our 18th annual. They do an incredible job. I thank all of you for being here. We're going to move on to the program. So forgive me for not making introductions around the room. Uh, I know there are a lot. Everybody is important. And I know we have um, some people who've, uh, I think the one that's come the farthest came from, I think, North Carolina, one of our governors. Um, but I would like to thank you for being here. And welcome uh, to our 18th conference. And we are going to have um, a guest on what movies Joe has picked this year to describe our economy. I've never gotten him right yet, but we'll see how close we can get. For those who've been here before, you know he always tries to tie into some movie that's been around. So if you uh, have thought about it and has written it down, we'll see how close you get. At this time, I'd like to introduce someone who needs no introduction, but uh, President King Alexander, President of California State University Long Beach, to say hello and welcome. Thank you, Jane. Thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, we've been doing this for 18 years, and we keep doing our job at the university to build the economy, and at the end of the month, we'll graduate over 9,000 students. So we hope that you're, you're recruiting our students and hiring our students because we're building the economy of Long Beach together and Southern California together. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, you're going to learn a lot about what we anticipate. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit like Las Vegas, as you know, in predicting where the economy is going. Uh, but we certainly appreciate all the support of our university and all the support you give to our students. So thank you very, very, very much for being here this morning. Jane. Thank you, President Alexander. At this time, without further ado, we have uh, Drs. Uh, Magadino and Grobar, who have been doing this uh, since I've been involved with it. And uh, they've been on target for so many years. I hope that they have uh, a little better news this year. And uh, we want them to be on target, but we want the news to be better. So uh, please welcome Dr. Joe Magadino. Thank you very much, Jane. King, that's the first time I've heard my research de described as a crapshoot. Uh, <laughs> good morning and welcome to our 18th Annual Economic Forecast Conference. Let me begin by thanking all of our sponsors for their support. I especially wish to acknowledge the platinum sponsors, the Port of Long Beach, the Gateway Cities Council of Governments, and Supervisor Don Kanabi. I do have uh, an introduction to make. I would like to introduce the newest member of the Department of Economics, Heather Stevens. Heather is a doctoral candidate at Ohio State University and has experience in local economic development. She'll be joining the economic forecast team. And let me have Heather stand up. She's not the tallest economist in the department, but... Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, I know our students are going to appreciate you and I think the work that you will be able to do with the community will be very beneficial. Before I begin with our presentation, I ask you to turn off or silence your cell phones as a courtesy to all in attendance. The packets that you have contain a copy of the slides that we're using in this morning's presentation, except for my introductory remarks. So I thought I would begin on a positive note and remind you that this recovery is almost three years old. It began in July of 2009. Given the weakness of the recovery, one can only assume that this is a limited release and may not be available in a theater near you. Now, last year, we began our presentation talking about the long-term structural problem facing the US economy, and that is the growth of the federal debt. Virtually all are in agreement that the current path is unsustainable. And of course, if it's unsustainable, then it won't last. But there's nothing in economic theory that tells us in terms of how high the debt can grow before investors or lenders lose confidence. So it really is a thin line between solvency and default. 
When you borrow funds, surprise, lenders expect to be repaid. If lenders question your ability to repay, then the interest rates rise, which exacerbates the fiscal imbalance. We're clearly not there yet. As I said, this is a longer term problem. Such was not the case for Greece this summer. As a sovereign debt crisis emerged, Greece could not refinance the debt and the prospects for default were relatively high. As you know, Germany and France needed to craft a plan for the European Union. The Germans were reluctant to tax themselves to bail out their neighbors, who they view as lacking fiscal discipline. After all, in the early 1990s, Germany addressed a series of deep structural changes to make its economy much more competitive. And while Merkel and Sarkozy deliberated, concerns spread to Spain, to Ireland, and to Italy. There was a legitimate fear that the euro would unravel, that there would be a meltdown of the European banking sector, and that financial institutions would fail, much like they did in 2008. Merkel and Sarkozy formulated a plan to provide bailout funds in exchange for austerity measures. And these austerity measures are now being questioned in some countries, given the results of the most recent elections. The European Central Bank has pumped in around 1 trillion euros into the banking system. And while these actions provide liquidity and time needed to address these problems, liquidity alone doesn't solve the problem. Had Merkel and Sarkozy not taken action, there was a strong chance that the US, the global economy, along with the European nations, would have fallen into a recession, a double dip recession. Oh, come on, I need a better laugh than that. I mean, the movies were really tough this year. Fortunately, this did not happen, although the countries, several of the countries in the Eurozone are already in recession. Meanwhile, the Fed ended its QE2 program, and depending upon how history plays out, Ben Bernanke may yet emerge as the artist of this recovery. As we gear up for the national elections this November, it appears that after a long and at times a very divisive primary season, the Republicans have coalesced around Governor Romney as their standard bearer. Now is it just me or do you think that Michelle Bachman looks better as a blonde? <laughs> now regardless of who wins the election, the reality is that we face a fiscal cliff in January 1 of 2013. We have the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, the payroll tax reduction is phased out, we phase out the emergency unemployment benefits that were extended, and most importantly, we have the sequestered funds that generate automatic cuts that will primarily be dealt with by the Defense Department. In addition to that, there's the ATM that is subject to expire, along with the, the doctor's fix. To put this in perspective in terms of the dollars involved, this amounts to a reduction in the federal government between 400 and 550 billion dollars, or 2.5 to 3.4 percent of GDP. So there's a significant challenge that faces any new administration. And the failure to deal with the problem, whether we increase taxes or whether we reduce expenditures, creates lots of uncertainty. And the uncertainty over the short term is harming the economy because individuals and firms sit on the sideline waiting to take action until they're really sure what the economic landscape looks like. So given that degree of uncertainty, we'll now turn our attention to the forecast and we have our own austerity measures going on in the Office of Economic Research. In the past, we were able to provide you with a booklet that contained comments as well as all of the tables. We've now moved that to a website. We used all of our uh, ingenuity and imagination to come up with the username forecast and the password econ2012. So uh, you can access that and that should be uh, live this morning. Uh, the other thing that's changed is we're not going to be able to post on our website these slides that we're presenting today, and the reason for that is they're not ADA compliant. And to be honest with you, the amount of effort, given the number of hits we get 
in terms of people downloading doesn't make sense. So what the researchers have agreed to do is we will supply you with copies of the slides if you so choose just by simply emailing us. Okay, with that, let me actually begin reviewing the forecast. The Great Recession was the steepest decline in the post-World War II era, and we're in the midst of one of the weakest recoveries that our nation has ever experienced. In 2010, it appeared that the economy had gained some traction and was growing at a rate of 3%. However, last year we saw the economy falter. The fourth quarter of last year looked to be relatively good at 3% growth, but the first quarter, at least the preliminary estimates for the first quarter, suggest the economy has again slowed, growing at only 2.2%. Our forecast really calls for only modest growth given the amount of uncertainty that we have both here and, and abroad. So we're looking for growth right around 2% for both this year and next year. The consumer price index, which is a popular measure of inflation, rose by a little over 3% last year, and most of that increase was associated with food and, and energy prices. And while food and energy prices remain high, the rates of increase that we're seeing this year are much more moderate. So we do believe that the inflation uh, index will show some moderation both this year and next year. The unemployment numbers remain persistently high, and we'll talk about that shortly. And we do believe, given the uh, positioning of the economy at the present time, the Fed will take no actions and will indeed sit by the sideline. So let's first of all talk about the past because it's a lot easier to forecast the past. Uh, the, the recession began uh, in December of 2007. It ended in June of 2009. The strong recovery that we saw in 2010 was really attributed to an inventory cycle, fairly typical uh, in this kind of business cycle. During the really deep losses that we saw during the recession, what happened is that output fell much more rapidly than final demand. And what that means is that we depleted inventories. People at UPS are, are nodding their head because that wasn't a good year for them. They weren't uh, moving a lot of product because there was not a lot of product to be moved because people were not restocking their shelves. You can do that for some period of time, but you can't do it indefinitely, and then eventually what has to happen is you have to restock those shelves, and that's what we saw in 2010, where we saw growth in output larger than final demand. We were building up inventory. The problem with that is we can't do that forever. You need much more sustainable economic growth that's balanced, and we didn't see that last year because we saw significant softening in the economy. As we move forward, we're looking for final demand to track a little bit more closely to output, which in fact is the more typical uh, situation. Let's talk a little bit about last year and why we were wrong. Last year, we thought that the economy at the national level would grow close to 3%. We knew that the economy was gonna be sluggish in part of the first part of the year, but we thought that there'd be sufficient momentum to really carry us forward in the second part, and that clearly did not materialize. And part of the reason for that was simply that there were significant headwinds that the economy uh, had to deal with last year. You recall that the so-called super committee failed to present a plan to, to deal with the long-term problem of the growth in the federal debt. The Republican-led House and the president were unable to broker a deal to address this problem. And it appeared that the failure to raise the debt ceiling would shut down the government and technically bring us to the brink of default. The political maneuvering of both parties seriously undermined consumer confidence as well as business confidence. And indeed, the solution that they finally agreed on was simply to kick the can down the road until after the national elections. In March of last year, Japan suffered a devastating earthquake and tsunami, and beyond the tragic loss of life and property, there were major disruptions in the global supply chain that particularly impacted the oil, excuse me, the automobile industry in the United States. We also had the Arab Spring, we had turmoil in the Middle East, we lost the oil from Libya, and we saw prices jump from $78 a barrel to 110, excuse me, $101 during the first half of last year. The $23 increase in crude prices eroded real purchasing power and that also slowed the economy. And lest we forget, the sovereign debt crisis that began in the summer. And while the ECB has done much, along with our own Federal Reserve to increase liquidity in the Eurozone, this action treats the symptoms, but not the very basis of the problems. 
And clearly the debt crisis and the austerity measures have forced some of the European nations into a recession, and that certainly dampened the growth of exports. I'd like you to pay particular attention to the next slide because the slide you have in your packets is wrong and I apologize for that, that's my uh, fault. But I'd like you to look only at the last three years, 2010, 2011, and 2012, and what this slide represents is the contributions of the various expenditure groups to overall GDP. So first let's look at the red bar, which is the contribution of consumers. And consumers, you can see, pretty much have held the course, that each year they're contributing about the same amount to overall GDP growth, in 2010, that, that blue bar investment you see is really high, but that's no more than simply the buildup of inventories. And we didn't think the buildup of inventories would carry forward, and so in 2011, you see that that has dropped. The real surprise for us is net exports. Okay? Net exports were really very, very strong in 2010. And we had thought that that was going to carry forward to 2011. And of course, that didn't materialize because we had a slowdown in the global economy. The emerging nations are growing much slower. We have a recession going on in Europe. And all of those things limit our ability to export goods along with uh, an increase in the value of the dollar. So moving forward, uh, we think that you, your strength is really going to be, again, in consumption and investment expenditures. On balance, the net exports should either come in as a slight drag or neutral, and of course, the government sector is now becoming a drag on the economy, which is simply atypical, uh, usually given uh, the business cycles of the past. So let's talk a little bit about consumption, consumption growth. Uh, we're looking at right around 2%. Uh, we think it is indeed unreasonable to uh, suspect that we could get to a more robust level of consumption growth, which would really be a, a good driver for the economy. Uh, not the levels that we saw uh, in the middle of the last decade where we saw consumption growing somewhere between two, two and a half to three and a half percent. It's not reasonable, and the reason why it's not reasonable has to do with the, uh, a variety of different factors. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is the job market. This recession generated job losses on the order of eight million. The recovery to date has generated job gains of around four million. So there remains a sizable number of people underemployed and unemployed. Given the slow rate of job formation, unemployment is going to remain persistently high. And more importantly, we haven't seen the job growth necessary to get the income growth to really move consumption forward. The last two months, employment numbers were disappointing. They averaged about 135,000 jobs in those two months. In the prior three months, from December to February, the average was 250,000, and it appeared to some that the economy was really well ready to take off. And in fact, it was a little bit perplexing. Even Ben Bernanke said he was confused by the numbers because it seemed to be the employment numbers were growing faster than the output numbers. And so now what it seems to us is while the numbers in the last two months are disappointing, they're probably more realistic with what we see in terms of the overall growth of the economy, okay? A modest level of economic uh, activity is taking place. Part of the increase of unemployment, excuse me, employment numbers in the earlier months may simply be due to the unusually good weather that happened back in the Northeast, which simply means that jobs were uh, moved up earlier in the calendar year than they otherwise might. Now, we do think that the employment is going to improve, and sort of one of the reasons why it's going to improve has to do with the productivity numbers. So this is both a good news and bad news scenario. The good news in the very short run is that firms have done everything they can to raise productivity, and they can't get any more out of their workers. And so the productivity numbers are down. So if you see an increase in demand, the only way you're going to be able to meet that increase in demand is by adding on to your labor force. And so that's the short run. That's the good news. The bad news over the longer term is productivity is one of the key components to determining long-term economic growth. And long-term economic growth determines our ability to increase our standard of living. So if these numbers remain low, then that means the long-term prospects for growth are greatly reduced. We don't think that that's going to happen. We think that in a couple of years, we should see a return to reasonably good productivity numbers. Consumers have done a fair amount 
of consolidating uh, their balance sheets. Uh, they've reduced uh, their non-mortgage consumer debt considerably. You show, we show a little bit of an uptick this coming year. And part of that is due to the fact that there's a lot of pent-up demand with respect to automobiles in particular. And auto sales have done really well. So consumers are at least confident enough to take on the additional debt burden. The other thing that's increasing now is student debt. Uh, believe it or not, student debt is the largest single item of debt in a household's portfolio other than mortgages. So it really eclipses all other uh, debt. So given the deposition of the consumer, it's improving some, but not enough to see really robust growth. And lastly, uh, it was a good quarter for the stock market. We're heading in the right direction in terms of the overall wealth uh, of households in the US, but clearly we're way below uh, the peak that we had before the recession began. Let's look at non-residential investment, and there's two components here. There's equipment and software and there's structures. And we display them separately because they behave differently at different points in the business cycle. During the downturn, they both go down really rapidly. But on equipment and software, firms can't postpone those decisions very long if they wish to remain competitive. And so as a consequence, they have to make those investments. And this time out during this recession, firms' balance sheets were relatively good. They, they are flush with cash. They can well afford to make the investments. And indeed, we saw them make uh, investments in equipment and software, both in 2010 and carrying forward uh, after that point. Structures are a little bit confusing because we don't new, normally expect structures to bounce back uh, as quickly as they did. But what's going on here has nothing to do with sort of building new office buildings or building retail buildings or the likes, the typical commercial buildings. What's in this category also is power plants, oil, and uh, other energy activities, petroleum extraction. So what we've seen with higher energy prices is we've seen an expansion of economic activity uh, in this particular area. We're not really looking for the traditional uh, business structures to really improve until 2013, and that will be only at a modest rate. Uh, by 2014, uh, it should pick up some. Let's look at housing starts. Housing starts bottomed out in 2009 and continued to run pretty much uh, around the bottom. Uh, we're looking for housing starts somewhere in the order of around 750,000 uh, units across the nation uh, this year. Most of that is going to be in multifamily dwellings. To give you some perspective on what these numbers mean, the long-term trend in housing starts should be about 1.5 million. And that's based on family formation, the demand for second homes, and the demand for replacement homes. And one of the things that's happened during this deep recession, and Lisa's gonna talk about it a little bit, is that household formation is way below the trend line. And so what we expect, or what I expect to happen, is that once the economy starts posting some significant improvements in the employment area and we start seeing some economic growth, we're gonna get a huge jump in family formation. And of course, because we haven't added on to our inventory, we're gonna begin another housing cycle. The existing home sales uh, have uh, trended upward, but still way below the pre-recessionary numbers. Residential fixed investment, as I just got through saying, we do expect some uptick here, but most of it is multifamily uh, units. Looking at, at the exports and imports, this really was the area that disappointed us most. The Eurozone is in recession. Emerging nations have slowed their growth path. The dollar has strengthened. And on balance, all of these things mean that our exports are going to uh, decline in terms of the overall rate of growth. So we expect them to be a slight drag in terms of the economy. Looking at the current account deficit, the current account deficit is now expanding, and much of that expansion is associated with increases in oil prices. The dollar has strengthened, and frankly, the reason why the dollar has strengthened is that the euro is now in question and people have moved to safety. The, the, that's good news in a way. But it's bad news if you're an exporter because it means that our goods are a lot less competitive in a global marketplace. We think that the dollar will continue to show some strength against the euro, but we do think that the longer term trend against the emerging nations is the dollar should start to slide. 
Government expenditures, I think you understand the story pretty well. Uh, we're looking at negative rates of growth uh, for the federal government both last year and this year, and that simply reflects the unwinding of the stimulus package. That stimulus package mostly was one-time expenditures. Those expenditures have been met, and so as a consequence, the rate of growth is negative. The situation uh, continues to deteriorate for state and local uh, government units. They don't have the same flexibility oftentimes that the federal government has in terms of running a deficit, although it's hard for people in Sacramento to accept that. Uh, nonetheless, what we've seen here is a, a clear deterioration uh, because the balance sheets of local governments and state governments simply lag the economic cycle and we're looking for uh, significant cuts again to take place this year. In terms of the federal debt, both in absolute and relative terms, the federal debt uh, has uh, declined or will decline in, in 2012. Inflation, this is the personal consumption uh, expenditure deflator that the Fed looks at. Uh, the red line is the total, which includes the food and energy, which are more volatile. If you purge those out, you get the core. Uh, our estimates suggest that it's well within the Fed's uh, uh, zone for comfort, so we don't anticipate the Fed doing very much. Inflation is not a near-term problem. Interest rates, fairly benign. Uh, so just to summarize, we're looking for really modest growth this year, right around the 2% level. We think that the uh, monthly employment numbers are going to come in at around 180 Thousand, but remember, we need about a million jobs every year just to uh, satisfy the new entrance uh, into the job market. Uh, and lastly, the inflation numbers and the federal debt we think are serious problems, but we think they are longer term problems. And with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to the intellectual driving force behind our research, Lisa Grobart. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm going to be presenting our outlook for the Southern California regional economy. And I thought I'd start out this morning by taking a look at the recent quarterly history of employment growth in Southern California. And about this time last year, we started to become increasingly confident of an imminent recovery in the region because we started to see a couple of quarters of just po barely positive growth uh, emerging in the region uh, right at the end of 2010. Although the annual number was a uh, decline for 2010, we, we started to see some quarterly gains. And the good news is that we have sustained positive quarterly economic job growth in the region ever since. Uh, the bad news is that the growth has not been particularly robust. And uh, in all of these quarters, you see that employment grew by 1% or less. So we would characterize this at the regional level thus far as a, as a modest regional recovery. One thing that's always interesting is to kind of compare how is the region doing compared to the nation in terms of job growth. Um, you can see that uh, the beginning of the recession we trended very close to the nation and then uh, our recession uh, became just a little bit deeper and more prolonged than the national recession. So you can see the region's recovery in orange began a little bit later. But by uh, the end of 2010, we had sort of caught up to the region's recovery, although we are trending a little bit lower in terms of employment growth in, in the latest few quarters than the nation. But overall, the cycle has been pretty much following the, the uh, national path. This is the same employment data, but it's just looking at the average annual rate of employment growth. And so you can see the last uh, uh, bar there is 2011. And uh, 2011 was the first year that we had positive employment growth in some time in the region. Again, it's been moderate growth. But one of the things that you can see with this time series here is that um, it's, it's not uncommon for uh, the region to see a period of moderate growth following a recession. So you can see that following the recession of the early 1990s, on the left there, uh, the first year out was pretty moderate, and the same thing with the rece recession of 2002. Um, but the year after that year uh, of recovery, uh, generally we see employment uh, accelerating, and that is actually the story that we will be telling today, and I'll have the forecast for you in a minute. But first, taking a look at the county trends, 
I think that the thing that stands out the most for 2011 was just simply that Orange County really led the economic recovery in the region. Uh, it was the only county that saw employment growth above 1%, and it just slightly so. Uh, the region grew at about 0.6% uh, last year, and that was exactly the rate of growth of LA County and Ventura. And then uh, the lagging area in the region has been Riverside, San Bernardino. But nonetheless, even that area saw positive economic growth. It was only a three-tenths of a percent gain, but it was a above-the-line growth even for that lagging region in 2011. So here's our forecast, and as I said, uh, the second year out looks to be a lot stronger than uh, the first year out of the recession. Uh, for 2012, we are predicting that the region will uh, post a job gain of 1.5%. So that's a lot stronger than the 0.6% gain we saw last year. And in fact, our forecast has the region uh, continuing to strengthen over the forecast horizon. By 2014, we're going to be adding jobs at, at just below the 2% line. So that these three years really represent a return to a more healthy and average rate of, of job growth for the region. What's the main difference between the region this year and last? Uh, one thing I would point to is a, is a strengthening in the cyclical sector. So the sectors that have suffered the worst downturn are now coming back, and more of them are coming back this year, and that's making our economy grow faster. One area that was pretty weak in its recovery last year was retail, but as consumers are really getting back into the stores and buying, as Joe mentioned, the automobiles, we're starting to see some employment growth there. The construction sector was obviously very hard hit by the housing downturn. It's not returning to any sort of uh, robust economic growth, but we, we actually think for the region at least as a whole, the construction sector will be above the line with slightly positive growth, and that's a big difference from where we've been. Um, but we're also getting a lot of our growth in 2012 in, in sectors like the professional and business services sectors, which recovered last year with positive growth, but is, is accelerating this year. And we're also seeing strong, a strong recovery in the leisure and hospitality sector and in, um, in healthcare. Uh, as I mentioned, construction is now positive, and that's kind of a big deal because uh, you have to go all the way back to 2006 to see a year where this, this sector even posted any kind of job growth at all. So it looks like the worst of the downturn is behind us, although this, is, this, this story varies across the region because we are seeing certain areas with continued declines in construction activity. But for the region as a whole, we think we're going to get a little bit of growth. It's not going to be until 2015 and beyond that this is going to show a strong cyclical recovery. Uh, as I mentioned, retail is one of the things that's propelling us to faster growth in the region this year, and uh, we're expecting above 2% growth in retail employment. Uh, over the longer term, there are some issues in retail employment that are dampening the growth. There's been productivity gains uh, that may mean that this sector doesn't grow this fast over the longer term, but we're getting a nice cyclical boost to gain back some of those many jobs that we lost in this sector during the recession, especially in 2008. As I mentioned, the, read, uh, professional business services, this is definitely a bright spot. Definitely a bright spot for the regional economy. We did get some pretty good job growth even last year of almost 2%, but you can see our, our forecast has, has the sector accelerating to 3% growth this year and almost 4% growth by 2014. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Um, this. I would say most of all is important because this is a sector that has a high average wage. There is diversity within the sector and I wanted to pull out some of the detail um, to give you some sense of, of what kinds of jobs are in professional and business services. And uh, we get the most detailed data for Los Angeles County, so the growth rates here are actually for LA, not, not the region as a whole. But uh, what we see is over the last 12 months, over 11% growth in jobs in accounting and ta tax preparation, bookkeeping, over 7% uh, gain in jobs in the area of management and uh, scientific and consulting. And these are areas with high average pay. The average pay for LA County as a whole is about 52,000. 
So as you can see, these two areas are growing rapidly. They're, high, they're creating high paying jobs. And so this is one sector that really is going to help boost our economy in 2012. I highlight also a third category called employment services. And um, this one is important, even though, as you notice, the, the average pay here is fairly low. Employment services picks up a lot of your temporary help, your temporary secretarial clerical type jobs that may not be particularly high paying. But uh, this sector is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it is usually a very good leading indicator of the economy because we often see that firms hire up on a temporary basis before they commit to full-time jobs. And the 13% growth in that definitely sustains our notion that, yes, this, this economy is definitely on a firm recovery path. And furthermore, employment services is one area that's a stepping stone for unemployed people to get a temporary foothold in the labor market and then often that, uh, that leads to a permanent job. So this is, a, this is very good news to see rapid growth in employment services. Leisure and hospitality recovered in 2011 and is going to add jobs at a pace of 3% this year. Again, we're adding back a lot of the jobs that we lost during the recession. And the reason why we lost jobs in this sector is that a lot of discretionary spending takes place in these categories. So during the recession, households stopped going or cut back on going out to, to eat in restaurants and businesses cut back on travel. And uh, what, we've saw, what we saw starting last year was uh, that we're starting to see those trends go back toward a more normal path and that's creating a lot of jobs here. The manufacturing sector was a source of job losses, unfortunately, during the recession. Um, it will not be a major source of, of employment growth in the region in the near term, but neither is it a drag on the economy. And actually, the growth in manufacturing is taking place um, mainly in Riverside, San Bernardino. So it is having an impact on some areas of the region, although for the region as a whole, it, it, it's not doing much either plus or minus in terms of job creation. But the recovery in the national economy is creating a lot more job opportunities in transportation, warehousing, and this is another cyclical sector that did recover in 2011 but is strengthening uh, a lot in this year and next. So we're seeing this year a much more broad-based growth uh, and accelerated growth in a lot of the cyclical sectors that we had previously seen a downturn in. You know, the, one of the uh, only remaining areas of contraction in the regional economy is government, both federal and state. Uh, federal government only plays a very small role in the region's economy. It's a fairly small sector, but state and local government is a large one. And this has been a, a difficult uh, area for our regional economy for some time now with some sizable employment losses. Unfortunately, 2012 will be a continued year of job loss in state and local government. What, what we find is that state uh, uh, revenues tend to lag the economy because the revenues coming into the state this year are based on last year's income. So with the job growth that's happening now, we do feel confident that this sector will turn around in 2013, but it will remain a, a drag on the economy's growth in the near term. Taxable sales is an area where we get, uh, uh, there's a big la lag in the data collection. So the state has just only recently published the taxable sales for 2010. And we're leaving us in a position to having to, of having to forecast the past. Um, so our 2011 number is a forecast. But uh, the good thing is that uh, while we felt pretty confident last year that sales had returned to positive levels, now we have confirmation that in 2010, in fact, uh, tax sales did grow after the tremendous decline in 2009. And our forecast calls for sales in the, in the range of 45 to 5% annually through the forecast horizon, and that puts taxable sales growing ahead of inflation, so we're getting some gains in real taxable sales. So to summarize where we see the region's economy, 2011 was in fact the start of the region's economic recovery. It was the first year of annual job growth, and all county areas within Southern California did see at least some employment gains last year. The good news is that we expect the region to uh, accelerate uh, pretty significantly to 1.5% job growth this year and to sustain healthy job formation uh, over the next two years, accelerating up to two, almost 2% 2 by 2014. 
I want to take a quick look at the individual county areas and first uh, turning to the Los Angeles County data. And here we find that Los Angeles County has tracked the region pretty closely, especially last year when the growth rate was identical to the regional rate of 0.6%. And like the region, we do have LA County accelerating in its growth to about 1.5% uh, this year. So it is a positive picture for LA as for the region. In Los Angeles County, as for the region, I'm going to highlight the four service sectors that are going to create almost all of the net job growth in the region this year. So if we look at LA County, for example, uh, adding about 60,000 jobs to the region's economy, which is about 60% of the total, because we're going to get a gain of about 100,000 jobs this year, just under that. Um, the bulk of that job creation is happening in just four sectors, and they are all private sectors, and they are, are all service sectors. Uh, health and education, which traditionally grows, as you know, because health services is relatively immune to recessions, will post some gains. Uh, I have already mentioned professional business services. The retail trade sector is going to generate a good number of jobs, and part of the reason for that is just that that sector is so large that any percentage pickup in uh, growth rates translates to a lot of jobs. And then the, that leisure and hospitality sector that I mentioned. So for LA County and for the region, it is these four service sectors that are really where, you know, this is the heart of the job growth that's, that's uh, propelling the region forward this year. Taking a look at Orange County, Orange County is interesting because it has led the region out of recession. And part of the reason why it's leading at this point is it, it was a little earlier in the business cycle overall. So Orange County felt the housing downturn very sharply and began to turn down in, two, in um, 2007 on an annual basis. Uh, so Orange County went into recession earlier, but the good news is it's coming out a little bit earlier and a little bit stronger. And I think one of the things that's notable about Orange County is that Orange County is going to post a gain in employment of almost 2% this year, and that's even without any real recovery in Orange County's housing-related sectors. So one of the big causes of decline in Orange County was, of course, the downturn in housing, but the associated loss in employment in finance, real estate, and in construction. And those sectors really have not recovered yet. They will uh, by 2014, and that's part of the reason why the economy will get even yet stronger. But even, but as of this year, even without growth in those areas, Orange County is generating a lot of new jobs. And so that's, I think, very good news. And it is those big four service sectors that is, is um, really creating a lot of this activity. And you can see in Orange County, the professional and business services, the same kind of path uh, as the region. So, even without the housing-related sectors, we've got a nice recovery going in Orange County. And uh, we predict that Orange County will remain the fastest growing county in the region through 2014. Um, that's a little unusual because usually the leader in terms of job creation is Riverside San Bernardino. But uh, that area has had its own set of problems. And so uh, we do anticipate that it will be Orange County that is going to be the leader in the region, at least in the near term. Let me talk a little bit about Riverside San Bernardino. As you know, this is one area where the subprime mortgage crisis hit particularly hard and the economic, uh, the uh, housing downturn. And uh, there was uh, tremendous job losses in the Inland Empire, in, especially in 2009. The good news is that the recovery has been uh, pretty quick in relative terms. So while Riverside has been lagging the region, this year it, you know, it still lagged, but it, it, but it did generate jobs at a pace of 0.3%. The region was a little, just a little higher at 0.6%. So the gap between the, the Inland Empire and the rest of the region is closing. So much so that by 2014, we actually think that Riverside San Bernardino will be just a little bit behind Orange County uh, with a job growth of 2.7% of versus Orange County's three. But that's a big acceleration even from where they are now. And then by mid to late decade, we do anticipate that job growth will, will actually further accelerate in this area and get back into its more normal historical pace of 4 to 5%. So we do anticipate that this area is coming back strong. 
It will eventually lead the region, but not in the forecast horizon that we have on the slide here. So it will be later in the decade. Uh, Riverside San Bernardino is gaining jobs in those four big service sectors, uh, as is the rest of the region. But there are also some additional sources of growth. Manufacturing, we're starting to see some positive job growth. And one area that historically has always been very strong in this area has been wholesale and uh, transportation-related employment. And as you can see, after the big downturn in the recession, this job growth is coming back very strong. We're looking at about a 5% gain, for example, in wholesale employment in Riverside San Bernardino this year. So we have in Riverside San Bernardino the general regional recovery, the service sectors. Now we've got the, the trade and transportation related employment coming back. The one area that is going to be the last to come back are the housing related sectors. And again, the, especially the construction uh, is, is remaining a bit of a drag on this region's economy. But in relative terms, it's, it's, it's doing a lot better than it has in recent years. Ventura County, the smallest county area in the region. And this county really followed the, the regional trends. I think the one difference is 2012 is going to be a particularly weak year for Ventura. They've, got, they've had some consolidation and layoffs affecting the healthcare sector, actually, in, the, in that area that have caused some job losses. And, and also the housing-related sectors, especially construction, are still remaining particularly weak in Ventura. We do anticipate that they'll be up to a 1% growth rate, but not until 2013. Okay, I want to uh, finish up my uh, uh, comments uh, talking about the housing market. And as you know, this has been so central to understanding what's going on, not only in the regional level, but also at the national level. And last year, we uh, switched our focus. Historically, we've been presenting you with data on the me median home price. And um, this last year, we switched to using what is known as the Case-Shiller Housing Index. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this actually is an index that combines LA and Orange County, so we don't, we're not able to break those out. But what we like about this index is it's based on a repeat sales methodology, looking at uh, identical homes that have sold more than once uh, through time. And because of that methodology that is a little bit more advanced than the median home price, it gives a much more accurate read on what's really happening to the value of homes in the area. So what is this telling us about 2011? Well, what it's telling us is pretty much what we expected but we, we hoped wouldn't happen, which is uh, we've been bumping along the bottom, and 2011 was pretty similar to the two years that came previously. So the housing market appeared to have bottomed out around 2009, but there's no recovery either. And, um, and we had hoped that by this point in the cycle, we might start to see that recovery, but it did not materialize in 2011. I guess the only good news is that we didn't see any sort of steep decline either, but we're really hoping to get the kind of recovery started up in housing that we're seeing in employment, and it just isn't there quite yet. And if you look at some key features of the current housing market, you, you definitely get a picture of a market that is not anywhere near normal. Um, sick might be another <laughs> way of describing it because um, uh, so many of the usual indicators are so far out of whack. Um, so for example, we've got investor sales at almost a third of all sales and going along with that, uh, a very high number of cash purchases. Well, what does that imply? It implies that the, the, the typical home buyer that we always rely on, which is the household that is buying a housing unit to live in, uh, is still largely not participating in this market. Uh, and that means that the market just is not anywhere near normal. And uh, another uh, abnormal indicator uh, is the percent of distressed sales. This would be your foreclosures plus your short sales, the combination of the two, accounting for about half of all sales. And again, that's a very, very high number. It's coming down, actually, from recent years, but it's, it's much higher than it would be in a typical year in the housing market. So the housing market's still got a ways to go to, to normalize. I think the biggest worry we have about the housing market at this point is the question, is there a second wave of foreclosures on the horizon? And we know, for example, that a large number of the uh, homes that were possessed in recent years uh, are, are homes that the banks are holding on to 
for various reasons, because of investigations that have gone on, and also uh, just the, the slow process of pushing these through uh, the process to get these foreclosures on the marketplace. So uh, the worry is that we've got this backlog of foreclosures. If they were to come onto the market very rapidly and there was no demand to meet the supply, could we see another decline in prices? That's probably the biggest worry. Um, in February of this year, we had a major agreement reached between the government and the major banks, which um, the so-called robo-signing agreement, settlement, um, and that, many analysts believe, uh, has paved the way for more of these, of this backlog of foreclosed properties to now come into the market in the near term. As a matter of fact, we were expecting that we might start to see signs of that as recently as April, but, but that has not yet materialized. Um, but on the positive side, the indicators of the uh, coming foreclosures, so to differentiate between those properties that, have already, that are already in the pipeline uh, to those who might be entering the pipeline, um, this notices of default, which is the first uh, notice given to homeowners that are late on their mortgages, uh, this is down sharply all across the region. And so on the foreclosure side, the, the bad news is we still have a backlog of foreclosures. The good news is the backlog isn't uh, going to be piling up at the rate it was in, in, in historically because we are starting to see these notices declining, and that would indicate that, that the new homes entering foreclosure are going to be uh, entering at a slower pace. Well, in trying to understand the housing market, uh, I tried to think of all of the different variables, both on the supply and demand side, that could be influencing housing in the near term. And then I tried to assess, well, are these variables moving in the right direction? Are they moving in the right direction in a positive way that's going to help the housing market, or are they moving in the wrong direction? And the good news is that for, for the vast majority of these indicators, uh, the answer is that they're at least moving in the right direction, which gives us some a reason to be uh, somewhat optimistic about this, this market. Some of these are things I've talked about in the, in the past, so I won't elaborate on them. Some of them are some new developments that are interesting. Um, of course, at the top of the list always has to be job growth, and this is, you know, the high unemployment rate is a key reason why, even though, you know, we've got all these other pieces in place, such as low interest rates and uh, high affordability, uh, we haven't had a recovery in the, in, the, in the housing market. Well, we can definitely say finally this year that the job uh, picture is on the right path. It's moving in the right direction. It's in the initial phases. The job growth last year was relatively weak, but we're, we're moving in the right direction on, on job growth. Interest rates for many years now, that's not been an obstacle for housing. Interest rates are low and all else constant, that's, that's positive for the housing market. As I mentioned, the new foreclosure activity is lessening, so that's the good news. The bad news is, and this is the only real negative that I put on the chart, we do have this backlog of foreclosures. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty as to how that could affect the housing market. Uh, so I do put some question marks there, but certainly that is the one neg factor that's clearly negative in the near term for the housing market. We've talked in, in recent uh, forecasts about affordability. It's at record levels. That has not changed. But there are some new developments that are going to play a role, I think, in the near term for housing. One of these is rising rents. Uh, because we're starting to really see some of the rental markets tightening up. And as that happens, it's going to push uh, some of would-be home buyers off the fence into buying. A, a number of um, uh, newspaper articles have highlighted, usually in you know, slightly different methodologies, sort of a rent-to-buy analysis for many regions uh, and cities across the nation. And uh, the analysis is starting to increasingly weigh in many areas toward buying being possibly even more cost-effective than renting. So rising rents, while it's bad for the renters, uh, it's good for the housing market. I'm going to talk about credit conditions, which I, I give a positive, a weak positive for, because they are not recovered, but they're moving in the right direction, and I'm going to show you some evidence of that. And then I'm going to finally talk about household formation, and Joe touched on this in his presentation. Uh, the trends are, again, starting to move in the right direction here, and that does indicate uh, some pent-up demand for housing, which, again, will be positive in the near term.
All right, so to look at some of these later factors that I've talked about, here's some data on rental rates. And this data is for Los Angeles County and the different areas within Los Angeles County. And what we're seeing is that rentals generally over the past 12 months have risen faster than the rate of inflation. So renting housing is becoming increasingly uh, expensive in real terms. Now, what about uh, credit conditions? I mean, if you, if you, if you don't want to pay that high rent, uh, can you get a loan if you want a house? And this has been a big concern, of course, because so much of this recession has had to do with financial markets. And uh, so what I'm going to show you next is some data that is um, collected by the Federal Reserve. And what they do each quarter is they send out a survey to senior loan officers and commercial banks, and they ask them about their lending practices. And in particular, this slide shows their responses when they are asked, are you tightening up on credit or are you loosening up? And what this graph is going to show is the net percent that are, are reporting a tightening of credit standards. So, not surprisingly, of course, in 2008, you can see that this, uh, this index rose very, very sharply. Almost all the banks were tightening up sharply on their lending standards. Since then, uh, the, the, uh, the index has come down, but what we really need to see is for this to cross the zero line. At that point, we've got more lending officers reporting that they are loosening standards than tightening. And we are starting to see just below the zero mark, especially in the latest quarter. So, I, I, I talk about this as moving in the right direction, but it is weak evidence of, of easing. And in the non-traditional mortgages, which were so problematic earlier in the decade, um, these are not easing quite as much, uh, but the trend is somewhat similar. Well, so credit getting maybe a little easier. What about demand for loans? Are people coming into the banks and asking to get loans in the first place? And again, this is that same survey, uh, senior loan officer survey. And what this is showing us is not unexpectedly in 2007, 2008, demand for loans down sharply. We saw a brief resurgence in the demand for loans in 2009 uh, when we had the federal uh, home buyer tax credit that pulled some buyers into the marketplace, then it sank below the zero line again. But the good news again is in the last few quarters, we're starting to see this above the line. So yes, some weak evidence of uh, some strengthening demand for loans and some slight easing, but the trends here look to be moving in the right direction. And then this final slide shows the actual loans made. And again, this data comes from the Federal Reserve. And it tells us, well, what was the growth in the real estate loans that were actually made in each year? And again, uh, 2011 was a continued decline in mortgage lending. So the bad news is that um, as late as 2011, um, this number was negative. But if we look at the last uh, three months and the 12 month percent change over those three months, we actually crossed the line into just just positive territory in February and March. So again, this this is a moving in the right direction, but uh, we're in the very initial stages, I think, of a recovery in terms of the financial side of the housing market. And then I want to touch on this issue of um, of households and household formation. And one of the things that we've observed in the Great Recession is that households have been bundling up in housing units. And we're getting, uh, it's much more common to see multi-generation families uh, living, sharing living quarters. And one question is sort of, is this the new normal? Because if it is, of course, that has implications for the housing market. But uh, my feeling is that this is driven mainly by financial and economic considerations that are going to be changing, I think, over the near term. And I think we can actually point to some evidence that this is already starting. This graph shows the, the rate of household, new household formation. And so what this tells us, going back all the way into the mid-1980s, is that in an average year, we get ha the number of households growing by 1.2% a year. So 1.2% is that red line there, which tells us the kind of growth we would normally expect. And household formation has always been somewhat cyclical. So again, you can see uh, back in 1990, the drop in the recession. You can see in the early 2000s, uh, there was a, a period of decline in the rate of household formation. Uh, but what's been really noticeable about this economy uh, is that ever since uh, really the housing downturn began, 
there's been a sharp, sharp decline in housing formation, and, and it's been persistent for a number of years now. And so in a sense, those households are missing. And, to, and mo more importantly, these households really represent pent-up demand for housing. Because unless you buy the notion that this is the new normal, then what is going to happen as the recovery um, lengthens and we get more and more job growth is that more of these households are going to unbundle. And so, you know, the, the, the young adults who, who graduated college and came home and have been living with their parents are going to go off and get that first apartment. And that's going to create more demand for housing. So we do think that there's significant pent up demand, much more so than has occurred in past recessions, uh, that could play a major role in the housing market in the near term. So, as I say, growing evidence of significant pent-up demand. And I think the first place you would look for the impact of that would be in the rental market. I'm going to go back just a second to point out that the last bar there is 2011. And you can see that with, even with the modest recovery in job growth, job formation did rise a little faster. So we're, I think we're already starting this process, but again, it's in the very initial phases because we're still well below average. But compared to 2010, 2011 had more growth in household formation, and 2011 saw the beginnings of a tightening in the rental market. I think these trends are going to continue. So I think in 2012, we're going to look to see more of this, more unbundling, meaning pretty rapid growth in demand for housing. And the first place we see it evident is in rental markets. We anticipate rental markets are going to tighten further once they do, that again pushes households into, um, makes them more likely to turn toward buying as an option rather than renting. While we don't think that that is going to have a major impact on the housing market this year, because our forecast for 2012 is, is pretty much flat, we think in 2013 and 2014 that that increased demand for housing will start to push up housing values. And I think that we will be able to absorb even that backlog of foreclosed properties pretty rapidly once we start to see that pick up in demand. Part of the reason foreclosures have been so damaging to prices is that there just hasn't been the demand side strength there to uh, pick up those, those properties. But I think that is going to change. And so our forecast for the housing market is uh, 20, 2012, another slow year. But I think recovery is in sight now, and we are predicting that that will begin in 2013 and will accelerate in 2014. It's going to be very closely tied to the job market because as, as, as jobs recover, this unbundling of households could happen at a faster and faster pace, possibly leading to a sharp increase in the demand for housing. And um, I think our major problem with housing in the second part of this decade is not going to be a lagging housing market. It's going to be, again, uh, we're going to ultimately going to be more concerned with housing affordability because, uh, as Joe mentioned, the pace of construction has not uh, kept up with this. So I think um, for 2013-14, what we're going to see is the last piece of the puzzle put into place in terms of the region's economic recovery, um, the housing market recovery, uh, which will mean that we will have a more complete economic recovery uh, beginning with 2013. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm going to turn my attention to the uh, Long Beach economy. This is work that uh, is done by myself, uh, but the bulk of the work really is done by Dr. Monaco. Uh, in moving to the city forecast, we focus on the same kind of data that we look at in the region. In other words, we measure economic performance by job growth. But cities are much smaller geographical units, and the residents don't necessarily live, work, and shop in the same area. So sometimes the job growth does not necessarily capture the full well-being of a city. And for this reason, in this morning's presentation, we're going to take advantage of some recently released census data to provide not only a profile of jobs in Long Beach, but of the residents. And we're going to begin by looking at unemployment. We've already told you that the employment picture is improving in the national economy. 
Lisa indicated in her presentation that California is lagging the nation, and frankly, Los Angeles and Long Beach are lagging the state. Long Beach historically has had higher unemployment than the state and county averages, and what's most alarming in the recent period is the gap is growing and not much prospect for it contracting over the near term. Now, typically, I don't pay too much attention to unemployment rates at the city because of the way in which they are constructed, but given the proximity of the census data, I think it's worth taking away from this particular presentation that the residents in Long Beach are not enjoying the same kind of improvement that we're seeing at the nation and in the state. And I'm going to return to this theme towards the end when I talk about the census uh, data. This gives you a quick snapshot of what's going on in the Long Beach economy. I'm going to remind you of a couple of things. This is establishment data, so that means it doesn't include the self-employed individuals. And unlike Lisa in the regional data where we have access to the first quarter of this year, the most recent data I have is the first quarter of last year. And so when I talk about 2011, they're not really actuals, it's a forecast. The reality is the number of establishments and the number of employees were relatively flat from 2010 to 2011. What's interesting is that payroll is larger. And so what that suggests to us, in addition to having some minor raises for some people, that some of the jobs that were part-time jobs migrated over to full-time jobs. And as a consequence, we get a higher average wage. The wage is about $52,000 on average, and that is about the same as what we see in LA County. In terms of the overall employment, we peaked in 2005. As I said, the employment levels have been flat the last two years. We're about 13,000 jobs uh, shorter than what we were at the pre-recessionary peak. So you might ask where the jobs are, and this is the same story we've been telling year after year. The, the sectors that drive this economy, first off, are logistics, okay? And that's mostly the port of Long Beach. It also includes uh, the Law, uh, Long Beach Airport. And just as an aside, we'll be releasing uh, uh, a new report on the economic impact of the airport and its uh, adjacent properties uh, probably in about a month. But surely what happens is the port of Long Beach is the main driver, not only for the city of Long Beach, but clearly for uh, the region. That's an important sector. The next sector that's really important is health and uh, health services and education. This is private education, not a very big component, so the real driver here is health care. And Long Beach has had a long, distinguished career of having excellent health care. We have Memorial Hospital, we have some of the people from St. Mary's here. This has always been a community where health care matters and we have high level of health care. In an economic sense, it operates a little bit like tourism in one way, is that people outside of the area come into Long Beach for the health care services. So in essence, we're exporting these goods and it adds to the overall economic vitality of the community. Government has been a, a strong employer here, but most of this employment is public education, and obviously uh, that's going to be a net drag on the economy uh, this year uh, for sure. Leisure and hospitality, tourism uh, really matters. It's about 10% uh, of the uh, employment base, uh, and it generates, the overnight visitors alone, generate about $330 million directly spent in the city of Long Beach. So uh, it clearly is an important sector. The other thing that probably sticks out to you is manufacturing. We've seen a big decline in the percentage of jobs in manufacturing. And since this is a political season and people are interested in jobs and interested in manufacturing, I thought I'd spend a little time trying to temper some of the discussion to show you what's actually going on. So this is a graph that takes the total number of manufacturing jobs and divides by the total number of jobs in the economy over time. So back in 1950, when I was a little boy, every one in three jobs was a manufacturing job. Today, that's less than one in 10. In fact, it's less than 9% of the jobs in the US economy are manufacturing jobs. And let me submit to you that during the decades of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and through much of the 1990s, we did not lose manufacturing jobs because we were outsourcing to Asian nations. The story here is the tremendous gains in productivity. You give workers more capital, they're able to produce more, and as a consequence, you need fewer manufacturing workers. Last year, we added 
207,000 jobs in manufacturing. You have to go back to 1998 to get another year where we added manufacturing jobs. The story here is exactly the same as the story in U.S. agriculture. In U.S. agriculture in 1880, we had over 85% of the population on the farm. In less than 100 years, that went down to less than 2%. And today, we are the second largest nation in terms of the value of agricultural goods produced. That's the manufacturing story. There isn't anything in national policy or state policy that is going to return around this long-term secular trend, nor should there be. Okay, let's look at mining, utilities, and construction. Lisa already talked about construction, so there's not really much to say here. The interesting thing for Long Beach uh, is really mining. Uh, of course, there's not a lot of mines in Long Beach, but what there is is gas and petroleum. And as oil prices went up, what happened is we saw uh, an increase in the amount of jobs in that area. And in a minute, I'll show you that those are relatively high paying jobs, not much going on in the utility sector. Government employment, let me deal first of all with the anomaly. Lisa indicated quite properly that at the regional level, we're losing federal jobs. That's not true in Long Beach. In Long Beach, we're getting an increase in federal jobs. And that's really a function of the two transportation centers, the port and the airport. Both of those facilities, either directly or indirectly, require more federal presence in order to effectively do their job in a secure environment. The uh, state government, that's mostly Long Beach City College, the California State University at Long Beach, and our system headquarters, and you know the story there. With the state budget, we anticipate uh, clear declines in terms of employment. A similar argument is going to happen with respect to local government. Local government is dominated really by Long Beach Unified School District, but both the local government and the educational sector are going to have a tough time because of the budgetary environment. So this clearly is going to be a drag on the Long Beach economy. Logistics is a brighter spot. Uh, I'm going to spend just a moment. It's not quite as volatile as the uh, graph looks like when you look at the support for activities. This is a problem we run into when we look at a small geographical unit like a city because we're measuring jobs in terms of how they're payrolled. So if I have a payroll office that dispatches workers to the Long Beach port, it's located in Long Beach, those are Long Beach jobs. If that payroll office moves to a neighboring jurisdiction, then what happens is we lose jobs even though they're still working at the port. So some of the decline you see from 05 to 06 really didn't actually occur in terms of overall economic activity. It's just the payroll location. But clearly, when we went in the recession, we lost jobs. And now we're starting to pick up jobs. And as again, when I get to these slides showing average wages, wages you'll see that these are relatively high paying jobs. This graph has an awful lot of information. On the left hand side of the scale, what we're looking at is we're looking at the percent of loaded cargo that is bound for export. Uh, and when we start off the period, we actually uh, have about 40% of the loaded cargo is for export purposes. But when we had the tremendous growth in the volume of traffic, both at Long Beach and Los Angeles, most of that was imports. And it dropped down to uh, below the 30% mark for much of the period. Now what's happened is that the terminal operators in the ports have been much more interested, given the lower levels of uh, inbound traffic, to start facilitating exports. And of course, there's a national initiative to facilitate exports. The Port of Long Beach uh, is, has several initiatives, one of which is uh, the grain operation to uh, facilitate that. Uh, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if you came away from this discussion without still understanding that over the longer term, much of the traffic still is going to come in is going to be the inbound traffic of, of imports. This gives you an idea of what's happened at the two ports. They peaked in uh, 2006, 2007, right around uh, 8 million of the loaded uh, containers. We went through the recession. Our forecast now suggests that by 2013, we'll be back to the pre-recessionary peak, which is essentially very good news. So this is the average payroll. I'm not going to go through each of the sectors for you, but I do want to talk about uh, a couple of the sectors. The uh, first one I'll talk about is logistics. It's about 13% uh, of the employment base in the city, and it has a payroll on average of 68000 the leisure and hospitality, you can see, has a relatively uh, low payroll, but almost 
80% of that employment is in eating and drinking establishments, and most of that employment is part-time workers. So that's a consequence is why you get such a, a, a low wage. The manufacturing is relatively high, and you can see the political appeal of wanting to have more manufacturing jobs, but over the longer term, I don't think that that's really going to happen. What could happen is what Lisa pointed out in terms of professional and business services. These are high paying jobs and we can start to try to grow these jobs in our economy we would do relatively well. And lastly, looking at construction, mining and utilities, that is an area that really has the highest average wage and that's primarily driven by what we technically call the mining sector. Now, this year, we're starting something new. Uh, we have a colleague over in the College of Business Administration, Flo Scott Flexo, who's done a uh, small business monitoring project. So the initial sample is quite small. Uh, you can access that information. I'm just gonna talk about a couple things that interested me in the report. First one, he asked about uh, past hiring. And what happened here is the small businesses Actually, we're a pretty good barometer in terms of what we saw in the aggregate. We saw employment flat. What his response uh, to his survey indicated that it was pretty well balanced. About 15% of the people expected increase and 16% expected to decrease. So that sort of coincided with our result. Uh, a little bit more interesting is what's going to happen in the future. The way you read this graph is at the 50 uh, mark, it's neutral. If it's below 50, they're negative. If it's above 50, they're positive. Uh, and the question really dealt with sales and revenue as profits and stuff like that. And you can see no matter which way you cut the data, uh, the small business community, uh, at least in his sample, is uh, fairly optimistic. And so we're looking forward to working with Scott and trying to blend the two different methodologies and seeing if we can get some better insight in terms of what's going on in uh, the Long Beach area. The commercial off office space, Frankly, this diagram is a little bit different than the one I'm usually used to presenting. Usually what happens is the Long Beach Airport area, because of its proximity to the freeways, has the highest occupancy rate. But what's happened in the last year is Boeing has consolidated some of its space and about 200,000 uh, square feet has become available and that's not quickly able to be absorbed. So the real winner here is downtown Long Beach. Uh, they have excellent uh, Class A and Class B facilities close to the freeway, uh, and the occupancy rate looks uh, uh, very high. Uh, Craig Kojin and his team at DLBA have shared with me an economic profile. I think you had some of that information on the tables this morning, and I encourage you to look at it because it gives us a very nice picture of what's going on uh, in the downtown area. Since the downtown has a relatively high rate of occupancy, you're not surprised given the quality of the buildings and the amenities of the downtown that the rates are relatively high. LAX and El Segundo, they have a vacancy rate of about 25%, and that's really what's accounting for the relatively low price. If we look at Long Beach and compare Long Beach to the other cities in the South Bay, we're actually doing much better than the neighboring cities, although none of the cities are doing as well as they were doing before the recession hit. Now, this gives you something about uh, information about housing, and I'm gonna to try to go through this as quickly as possible because this is simply a depressing slide. Um, so prices are, are heading downward. About the only good thing I can say is, is the rate of decrease is decelerating. Uh, when we look at housing prices and we look at uh, the different zip codes, you're not surprised to find out there's a lot of variance or, or diversity of changes across the uh, city of Long Beach. I'm gonna just talk about two. 90802 is the downtown. And while they didn't have a lot of houses that sold, you actually see that the housing prices are up by almost 30%. Where we built all those condos, those condos are selling and the rate of price decrease is actually quite small in comparison to what it was in the prior year. The other zip code I'll look at is 90814, which is Belmont Heights and Rose Park area. You can see that both in terms of housing and in terms of condos, uh, really significant declines. And I'll show you what's going on there if we look at the forecast, uh, excuse me, of the foreclosure map. March of 2011, if you look at the, uh, the 90814 zip, you can see that it's in the darker red color, indicating that there's a lot of foreclosures. Uh, those banks want to get rid of that property, so they cut the prices, and that's really what was generating the price decreases that what we saw uh, in the previous slide. 
If you look at this uh, march, you can see that the Belmont Heights Rose Park area is a little bit uh, better. Uh, not a lot of foreclosures, but um, uh, a disappointing news is that uh, Belmont Shore, which was not much of a problem last year, seems to have a problem this year. Again, the, the problem that Lisa mentioned with the foreclosures is we're looking at it backwards. If we look at the defaults, we're trying to move out of this. Once we get rid of this inventory, uh, we'll be positioned to move forward. So let's talk about the census. I believe I gave this information uh, last year. Uh, the surprise was that the population in Long Beach was relatively flat from, 20, from 2000 to 2010. From 1990 to, 20, to 2000, we picked up about 30,000 uh, new residents. Uh, because we're flat, that means other areas within Los Angeles County are growing, so our share of the population is actually uh, down somewhat. The median income number is better than 2000. Again, this is adjusted for inflation, so it's real. But the median income is still below what it was in 1990. Now realize, those of you who have been in Long Beach a long time, 1990 was an entirely different economy. We had the shipyards, we had the naval hospital, we had a larger presence of federal uh, government employees. Uh, McDonnell Douglas had a much larger payroll than does uh, Boeing today. So it's a, a different uh, environment. Uh, and in fact, this data would be very similar if I looked at LA County in 1990 and looked uh, at 2010. This particular map uh, tries to give you an idea where the population is growing. Uh, the darker areas means that we're losing populations. The areas that are, are more green indicates that we're picking up population. And it tells you what we already know, is we built all those condominiums downtown and people moved to the downtown. And that's where the population primarily uh, went up. We're using the traffic analysis uh, zones uh, for some technical reasons as opposed to the census track information. Uh, in terms of the trends in race and ethnicity, there really wasn't much new in the uh, uh, census. The same trends that we saw in the earlier release of 2000 are carrying forward. The Hispanic population tends to be the dominant uh, ethnic population uh, in the city of Long Beach as it is throughout much of the uh, region in Southern California. In terms of the black and, and Asian populations, their share is about what it was in 1990, but the trend is somewhat different. The Asian population has picked up some and the black population has dropped. This particular slide gives you some information in terms of where are people living based on different uh, ethnicities or race. And this particular one looks at Latinos and the darker colors mean that they're more concentrated there, the lighter co colors, the less concentrated. And so we find out that the Latino population has to be in North Long Beach and on the west part of Long Beach. If we look at the black population, the black population historically has been in the north section of Long Beach, but in the 2010 census, it's a lot more dispersed than it was in uh, 2000. Uh, so uh, that's what that looks like. And lastly, the Asian population mostly concentrated on the west side and along the Alameda, uh, excuse me, the Anaheim corridor uh, going through uh, central Long Beach. This is some disappointing news. Uh, we have about 24% of the households within the city of Long Beach that have income below 25,000. So this really is the, sort of the issue uh, of poverty. And closely related to that issue is educational attainment. And so we, we've done a better job with educational attainment in the last 10 years than we did in the prior 10 years. So if we look at one end of the tail of the distribution, we have fewer people that uh, don't have high school degrees in our economy. And that's a good trend. Uh, we need to raise educational attainment. And of course, this is going to be a real challenge because we're trying to raise educational attainment at the same time that we're cutting public education funding. The other thing I would have you look at is the, the other tail of the distribution, bachelor degrees and graduate degrees. 27% of our residents have either a bachelor degree or an advanced degree. And these are the people who have the most value added in an information-based economy, and these are the people that we have to increase their percentage if we're going to actually grow the economy. And when President Alexander came here, he indicated one of the things that we need to do in this city is we need to capture more of those 9,000 graduates that are gonna walk across the stage in May. We need to make sure that they stay in Long Beach as residents and workers if we're gonna build this economy forward. 
So just to really quickly summarize, we're expecting only modest growth this year in the city of Long Beach, around 800 jobs. The primary engines of growth remain the same as what we've always said they were, is transportation, healthcare, and tourism. Uh, government is clearly going to be a drag on the overall performance of the economy. And my look of the census is there really wasn't very many surprises other than the fact that the population uh, remained relatively flat. I want to acknowledge the work of, of Jackie Mills in our geography department that helped us uh, with the uh, maps, as well as Scott Flexo in the College of Business, who has undertaken uh, the uh, business monitor. And with that, I thank you for your support. I gave you a lot of information. We'll give a couple of minutes for questions. If you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. I want Lisa back on the stage because all the difficult questions are directed to her. Well, I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, uh, definitely we're seeing the large sort of institutional investors coming into the real estate market. And um, our prediction is for further tightening in rental rates. So I think a, a bigger issue later in this decade is going to be how do we maintain affordability? Uh, because I think that although the home ownership rate is going to recover a little bit, it's not going to quite reach the levels that it did before the recession. I think the other thing that's not going to go back to the pattern before the recession is lending. I think it's going to be, it's going to ease further, but it's never going to become as loose in terms of the lending standards. And so you're going to have a permanently lower home ownership rate, which means you're going to have a, a larger segment of the population in rental units. And so I do think you're exactly right. I think that we're going to see this as a greater public policy issue in terms of how that's going to be managed. Uh, how are you factoring in, or do you factor in the uh, proposed income tax increases in the state of California and the exiting of businesses? Well, I mean, the the baseline forecast does include some assumptions with regard to taxes at the national at level. At the national level, uh, you know, the, the assumption is that the lame duck Congress will do the really courageous thing and temporarily extend the Bush tax cuts and everything else until the new administration uh, takes office. But eventually, we don't believe that the funds will be sequestered. There will be some reductions in terms of the entitlement programs as well as some tax increases. So, uh, but we didn't do any particular modeling at the state level. Anyone else? The number one agricultural country is China, but not by a whole lot. Remember, that's a large country with a large number of people to feed, so they're not uh, a tremendously uh, uh, well-known exporting country because they're feeding their own people. But in terms of the overall aggregate value of agricultural goods, China is actually number one. Well, actually, the, the fact that uh, we have a large uh, amount of baby boomers in our economy, uh, we actually compare more favorably uh, to other developed nations. So part of the reason why we think the U.S. is going to grow faster than Europe, even without the sovereign debt crisis, and faster than Japan, is that in some sense we have a younger uh, population. So uh, uh, that over the near term, that should work uh, to uh, the advantage. Uh, although I'm reminded of, of the cartoon I saw earlier in the week uh, where the, the physician tells the person uh, that the life expectancy has gone up and this is nature's way of helping you pay off your student loan. <laughs> Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I think you're looking at the, the, the graph of the Fed data on the real estate lending. Yeah, uh, that's just actually historical data. 
that is provided by the Fed. So we're just looking at the year-over-year -year change in the volume of, of lending as, as the banks are reporting it to the Fed. So this is commercial banks. No, that's not a forecast. That's, that's uh, historical. Yeah. So all of that data you can find on the, on the Federal Reserve website, and they monitor all of these things very closely. Okay, I take this last question over here. Well, it's, the question is, uh, can we spend our way to economic prosperity? And the comparison is uh, with Europe, because the problem in Europe is in joining the European Union, the countries gave up any ability to uh, have a monetary policy. And so if you had a monetary policy, and say you're Greece, one of the ways of, of solving this problem is you simply would devalue your currency and you try to inflate your way out of the problem. And so Krugman, in my opinion, is arguing that in the short term, he's willing to pay the price of having more inflation in the economy to get the economy moving forward faster. Uh, I don't agree with that particular prescription. No, but I, I, I would add. <laughs> that so this, this is, is an advantage. This is the uh, example of economists disagreeing. <laughs> right. Uh, this is something that we're actually actively debating in the in our department because definitely there are, there are different views here, and uh, you know here you have Bernanke who's a, an esteemed scholar and Krugman with a Nobel Prize, but they can't quite agree. Um, I mean I would argue that looking in retrospect, the the Obama stimulus could have been bigger, uh, but the problem is. Can you really fix that now, given that these things take, take uh, some time to affect the economy and the, uh, the economy is already on a recovery path? You know, there, there's differing uh, views on this. And uh, also certainly differing views on how, how much risk of inflation you think that the economy should be taking, how do you weigh the problems of unemployment and inflation and all of that. So uh, this, is, this is definitely an area of raging debate within the, within the discipline of economics, for sure. I thank you very much for your attention. We're going to stay around a little bit to handle any other questions. Uh, and again, I appreciate your support.